And now to the stage. Please welcome Alicia Keys. Fantastic. I am so, so grateful to be here. I'm so excited to be here with you tonight. Who's ready to vote on Tuesday? That's what I'm talking about. We bring all our friends, all our family, all the people we know. Um, because Pennsylvania, I love you. Thank you so much for the love. Thank you. I believe that our vote is a precious gift. It's a gift of love that we give to each other. But that gift wasn't just handed to us simply, you know. A woman's right to vote did not come easy. Suffragists organized for 70 years before the 19th Amendment was passed. By Congress, by the way, so we have to vote up and down the ballot. And it didn't pass the first time. And it didn't pass the second time. It didn't even pass the third time. It took four tries to pass, and only by two votes. It's been opposing forces all the way, from abolition to suffrage to this very election. But it's, it's the difference of a vote or two that can change the course of history. That's inspiring to me, because sometimes we feel like, you know, it doesn't mean something when it does, a vote or two. And getting the right vote wasn't the end of it. It took until the 1970s for women to get equal access to higher education, to be able to open a credit card in our own name, to make sure we couldn't get fired just for being pregnant. And we had reproductive freedom, but not so much now. And that's why we're still fighting today. That's why we can't get comfortable, because they're already starting to take those rights away. If it's been done already with Roe versus Wade, what makes us think that there isn't a leader in place, there couldn't be a leader in place from the other side that would say, forget equal play, forget equal pay. Women don't need it. Or we don't need to educate women anymore. They can just stay at home. They don't work anyway. No. no. And this is not some dystopian Netflix show that I'm talking about. <laughs> this is like the platform the other side is running on. They want to turn back the clock, but let me ask you, are we going back? Yes. Yes. They're trying to take us back. They're trying to take our safety away. They're trying to take our dignity away. They even are trying to take the, our right to vote. It's on the table. Last week, an ally of Kamala's opponent, because honestly, his name doesn't deserve to be spoken out of my mouth. One of these Project 2025 people put out a video, and you know what he said? He said, when we said we wanted male-only voting, we meant M-A-L-E. And then he said, the 19th might have to go. That's what he said. He said that, then he said, oh, it's just a joke. But it's not a joke, because it ain't funny. And I have yet to laugh at, one of these, at any one of these things these jokers say. I see too many people trying to disenfranchise us, especially the votes of marginalized people. But you know what that tells me? That tells me that every vote does matter. And if you're still not sure, I want to remind you that your vote is equal to everyone else's. Your vote counts just as much as any of these other billionaires. In fact, it matters more because there's more of us.
And I know it's easy to look at this uphill battle in front of us and think, I don't really matter and my vote doesn't matter, but we know better because you do matter. Your vote matters, your voice matters. And if you don't use your gift, your vote, the vote that our ancestors fought so hard for, they'll take that from us too. If you let apathy, dismay, disinterest, or disinformation keep you away from the voting booth, you're giving your power away. And as Kamala says, your voice is your power. This Tuesday, I'll be using my voice and my power, like I said, to vote up and down the ballot. Let's not forget that. On behalf of women everywhere, for those who can't vote, for those who are afraid to, on behalf of my bonus daughters, who young yet to vote, and on behalf of my sons as well, because I want them to grow up in a world where they can see that leadership has many faces. And that one of them looks like Kamala Harris. It's crazy, yeah. Yes. It's crazy because too many people think women can't lead just because they haven't seen enough of it. When our kids look around their classrooms at the pictures of presidents on the wall, every single one is a man. One black guy. No wonder it's hard for many to imagine a female president. They've never seen one. And if they can't see it, how can they believe it? If you don't vote for her or you don't vote at all, you're voting for the chaos and the hate. You're voting for a cruel tomorrow for immigrants, people of color, women, girls, our children, and our planet. Let's give Kamala, that's right, we're not going back. Let's give Kamala the power to make the change we want to see, especially by voting up and down the ballot so she can have the team and support that she needs to make the changes we need to see. Yes. We are a beautiful melting pot of dreamers and pioneers, and we believe every life has equal value. We want peace in our world and a healthy planet and a just society, and Kamala and Tim Walls assures me that this is what she believes and will work hard to fulfill. So Pennsylvania, you are so important, perhaps the most important. So this Tuesday, use your voice, use your vote to make Kamala Harris our next president. Let's do this! And now I welcome Adam Moffat to the stage. Hello, everyone. My name is Adam Moffitt. I was born and raised in Narsan. I'm a senior at Narsan High School. <laughs> and on Tuesday, I will probably be casting my first ever vote for Vice President Kamala Harris. Because there is so much at stake in this election, our future is on the line. And we need a president who cares about families like mine. Someone who will fight for, families, for people like me and for my brother and sister. Someone who will help young people like me afford to buy a home. <laughs> Someone who will cut taxes for middle class Pennsylvanians and protect our freedom. Yeah. Bottom line, we've got to get Kamala Harris in the White House. Yeah. Because Donald Trump doesn't care about us. He's all about himself. He wants to cut taxes for billionaires while making it harder for the rest of us to get by. He's got nothing planned to help young people like me, just more of the same. I'll be graduating this spring, and I do not want to step out into Donald Trump's dark vision for America.
I want to step into a country led by Kamala Harris, a real leader who will turn the page on Trump and fight for us. It's go time. And as someone recently told us, it's, not, it's all on us to do something so, to make this happen. And I am so, so honored to turn this over to, to her, the one and only First Lady, Michelle Obama. <laughs> Alicia Keys, such a wise soul, my little sister. Um, I also want to thank so many of our elected officials for being here. Of course, your governor, Josh Shapiro, and your first lady, Lori Shapiro, Congresswoman Madeline Dean, Speaker Joanna McClinton, and Montgom Mo Montgomery County Commissioner Jamila Winder. But most of all, I get, again, I want to thank all of you for joining me on a Saturday night. I love you all, too. I love you all. And it feels so good to be together, doesn't it? Oh, it feels so good to see how strong and how hopeful and how organized we are, right? And when I think about the, the energy we've seen over these past few months from Kamala and, and Doug and, and Tim and Gwen Walls, the, the big rallies, the big smiles, the optimism, I, I can't help but think back to another campaign back when when my husband was running for this office. Back, back then, back then, and we did, and we can do it again. But let me just share with you, back then, we had the unique opportunity of traveling this amazing country in a way that very few Americans get to do. Um, talking with folks about their hopes and their, their struggles and their, their dreams. We visited coffee shops and VFW halls and family farms, uh, meeting with folks one-on-one -on -one in their living rooms, taking our girls, they were so little, to all these county fairs in the RV, eating a little too much ice cream and fried things on sticks. And as you know, as, as the time went on, the stages got a little bigger, the lights a little brighter, and, and somehow, some way, our little family ended up in the White House. <laughs> and, and over those eight years, I saw this country at its fullest. I planted seeds with elementary school kids. I, I held baby showers for expect, expected military moms. I laughed and danced with a 106-year-old woman in the blue room. I, I wept with parents who'd just lost their children in a senseless act of violence. I, t I talked with all sorts of folks, moms trying to build their careers while getting kids to school and putting decent food on the table. 
teenagers dodging bullets on their way to school, first-generation college students struggling to find their footing on a campus where very few people look like them. There were so many highs and lows during that time, and the range of emotions on any given day could be staggering. I'll never forget one day in June when we were in Charleston, South Carolina, consoling families at the funeral of their loved ones killed by a gunman during Bible study. And then just a few hours later, as the sun set, we were back at the White House watching it lit up in the rainbow colors of the LGBTQ flag <laughs> in honor of marriage equality becoming the law of the land. I have seen every gorgeous, discordant gradient of the American spectrum, the pride and joy of gold medal winners representing this country, the resilience of wounded troops fighting to walk again, the struggles of folks trying to find work during the economic downturn, the optimism of immigrants and dreamers trying to build a better life. And looking back, what stands out most than anything during that time is the fundamental goodness we encountered folks everywhere we went. And it didn't matter if folks were fired up and ready to go or, or speeding off in the other direction. It, it didn't matter if they looked like us or talked like us or voted like us. No matter where we went, y'all, north, south, east, west, it, it always felt as though, even with our differences, something true, something fundamental was stitching us together. The, the values that have guided and nourished us for generations. I, I'm talking about the, the way my parents raised me, the, the way your parents raised you, that if you work hard, you can get ahead, yeah. that we, we look out for the least of these and love thy neighbor, yeah. that we treat folks with dignity and respect. I'm talking about all the parents doing their best to raise their children to be something more. Neighbors who drop off a meal when you have a baby or a death in the family. Farmers pitching in to help with the harvest when someone's sick. Teachers sending kids home with a sandwich so they have food in their bellies. Pennsylvania, this is who we are. This is us. This is our creed as Americans. That, that if we keep our feet on the ground and our eyes on the horizon, we will leave this country a little better than we found it. Each and every generation, we've done that. Seeking out more justice, more opportunity, more equity, lifting more people up, bringing more people in. From, from slavery and segregation to the march for justice today, from suffrage to the climb up the corporate ladder, from the closet to the pride parade. Look, folks, we, we don't always get it right. But here in America, we rise more than we fall, y'all. That's who we are. And, and yet, for, for so much of this election cycle, we have been inundated with voices and forces that tell us another story about who we are. The folks telling us that things may not be as they appear, that we should be suspicious of our neighbors, that military service and sacrifice is for suckers, that there's an enemy from within. See, we've had this noise buzzing in our ears for over a decade now. But at least for me, y'all, it's still not normal. It is still unsettling every time I hear someone say that the hope and pride that I feel for the country I love is misplaced, that, that down is up and right is wrong. My God, it's bewildering. It is, it is dangerous. It is shameful. Now, of course, we've been battling for the soul of our democracy for a very long time. 
and the tactics to tear it apart are not new. Sadly, they have become more insidious, more, more cunning, led by a more skilled con man who is more brazen and bombastic. But this, too, is part of the great experiment that we call democracy. Can people who strongly disagree still find common ground? And throughout our nation's history, we, we haven't always been able to answer that question with a resounding yes. We have had our fair share of dark moments, some lasting for decades, stretches of time that have been hard and scary. But, but for anyone who's ever endeavored to build or do something hard or scary, erecting a skyscraper, scaling a mountain, even a child building a sandcastle, you learn very quickly that it's a lot easier to destroy than to build up. <laughs> See, you can spend a lifetime carefully, painstakingly constructing something brick by brick, but it takes only one big wave, one strong gust of wind, and all your efforts can be swept away in an instant. That's what's at stake in this election. In this country, real change, true progress is, is hard to achieve, and it, it does take generations. It, it has taken years and years of sweat and blood and focus and strategy strategy to make incremental forward movement in this country. But the wrong outcome can throw so much of that progress away. That's true in politics and in life. But that's why we lean on a higher power. That's why we lean on each other. Because every day we work and we work and we work with the full knowledge that at any moment it could all vanish. See, destruction is swift and merciless. Maybe it's a hurricane that rips through the coastline. Maybe it's a virus that steals our loved ones and leaves us isolated and alone. Maybe it's technology that multiplies our rage and magnifies our differences. Or maybe it's a small man trying to make himself feel big by pouring gasoline on other people's genuine pain and anger and fear. There are a lot of folks hurting out there, a lot of folks feeling invisible, ignored, and justifiably frustrated with what's happening in their lives or in the world around them. And so many of these political issues can feel irrelevant to your day-to-day -day existence, at least until they directly impact your life when it's your family trying to keep up with the rising cost of groceries, when it's you who can't see a path to owning your own home, when it's your kids whose school isn't keeping up or the board is banning their books, when it's your family at risk in a conflict overseas or stopped at the border, when it's your son or daughter is the one whose life choices are limited because of who they love, the anger and despair hits especially hard. But during those dark and difficult times, y'all, we need leaders who will connect with people's pain and address the systemic issues at their root, not leaders who stoke our fears and focus our fury on one another. See, because once you open up that gasoline can, once you wink at hate, and make it normal to call somebody a bimbo or low IQ or human scum? Look, you cannot control how fast and how far that fire of hate will spread. All of a sudden, someone feels emboldened to say that our fellow citizens in Puerto Rico come from an island of garbage. All of a sudden, folks are saying a political opponent is the Antichrist. All of a sudden, folks are marching with torches ramming cars through crowds of peaceful protesters, marching on our nation's capital to overturn a free and fair election. Look, y'all, as I said, destruction is swift and it is merciless, and no one knows where it will stop. See, one day it's coming for folks you never met. 
Maybe it's immigrants or black people or trans community. Then it's coming for a neighbor, a friend, a family member who's Puerto Rican or Jewish or Palestinian. But then it's coming for you. <laughs> Pennsylvania, this election is about many things. But one of the most important is reclaiming the mantle of who belongs in this nation. Because, let me tell you something, this country does not belong to any one group. Not, not it when it was built on the backs of us all. And, and I'm not just talking about our ancestors who toiled in the factories and fields for generations. I'm talking about every man and woman who wakes up every day and goes to a job they may not love, but who still contributes to the fabric of this nation, folks of all races and political parties, folks who drive buses and wait tables and fight fires and take out your trash and take care of your kids and pour concrete. The America that we love exists only because of all of our brothers and sisters. And no one, and I mean no one, has a right to a bigger stake in this country than the next person. All of our voices have merit. All of our struggles and hopes have meaning. And anyone who is trying to change that story all, anyone who tells us that American excellence is the product of only a chosen few, or that this country will improve only if we cast more folks aside. Let me tell you, I promise you, they are trying to erase the truth of what's always made this country great. They're trying to reverse the lessons we teach our children about how you've got to work for your seat at the table, how, how true excellence is earned you can't inherit it or buy it. How every life has value. Pennsylvania, that's not the type of leader we deserve. We have to choose leaders who embody the values we seek to pass on to our children. There is no way that we can tell our kids that anything is possible, that we should be open and accepting of every voice and perspective and then give them a leader who contradicts all of those lessons we've taught them. All of our children are precious, and they deserve better role models. They, they deserve to grow up in a country that embraces them, no matter who they are or where they come from. Our children deserve to live in a world that nurtures their God-given promise and inspires them to be better humans. So we cannot forget that the words our leaders utter have real impact on them. Those words can build them up or they can tear them down. And if we keep exposing our children to hatred and ugliness, we risk eroding their sense of humanity. We, we risk breaking their spirits we risk ex extinguishing their hope for the future. If this election goes the wrong way, this, this backward vision of America being spewed by Kamala's opponent, it will infect all of our lives, no matter how old we are. We're not going back. I pray to God. we fail, it will happen quickly, in concrete ways, large and small, from dismantling the Department of Education to, to gutting the women's health system, to prioritizing those at the top over everybody else. And it will be felt in ways less concrete, the things that happen when folks are encouraged to ignore the better angels on their shoulder and embrace the darker forces that exist within us all. The racist chants at high school sporting events, the neighbors who won't make eye contact because of politics, 
the walks down the street that feel a little more dangerous because you look or love or talk a little differently. The idea that we would choose that path again, y'all, it absolutely breaks my heart. And I know it, it terrifies so many of you as well. Look, I, I don't know about you, but that is not the America I know and love. It is not. But thankfully, there are a lot of good reasons for us to still have hope, y'all. Because, as Kamala said the other night, it doesn't have to be this way, y'all. In this election, we have the chance to start moving beyond this decade of dangerous upside-down thinking, beyond the constant buzz of rancor and hate, and build the work, do that work of building a more vibrant and inclusive America. Yet we can do that only if we elect a president who has all of our best interests at heart. Someone with the character and strength and intellect to lead us through all the very real challenges we face. Someone who can ignite the open, inclusive spirit of the next generation. Someone who can reaffirm all those things we tell them, that everyone is important, that the future is something not to be feared but embraced. And we can do that only if we do everything we can these last three days to make sure that the next person sitting in the Oval Office is our friend Kamala Harris. <laughs> will positively and profoundly affect all of our lives. Instead of someone who's only in it for themselves, we will have a president who's in it for you. Instead of someone who'd accelerate the dismantling of our women's reproductive health system, we will have a president who believes in our freedom to make decisions about our own bodies. Instead of a criminal and an abuser, we can have a president who has prosecuted lawbreakers and protected victims instead of someone who cozies up to dictators and denies elections. We will have a president who will work to strengthen and expand our democracy and do it all with warmth, joy, and grace. And the most profound and irreversible impacts of a Kamala Harris presidency will be felt by our children and grandchildren. As I said before, they deserve a leader who serves as an example of the absolute best America has to offer. They deserve someone they can respect and emulate, someone who will teach them compassion, empathy, and accountability, someone who doesn't make themselves feel big by making others feel small. Someone who invites them in to experience all the beauty and possibility of this country. Pennsylvania, our children deserve to grow up with the extraordinary leadership of Kamala Harris. On every measure, every measure, ability to do the job, life experience, moral behavior, Kamala emphatically shows us that she is the president this country needs right now. Because in this moment, with so many folks hurting, with so much going on in this country and in this world, we need a president with the spine and the heart to help us all regain some steadiness. Someone who gives us the chance to wipe away the grime that has been spewed all over us. To look again with clear eyes and see the good, decent, big-hearted America we've always known. Pennsylvania, that is our hope and that is our duty. You know, y'all, last week I was in Kalamazoo, Michigan. 
where I, I met uh, an amazing woman named Delphine Clayfoot. Delphine turns 100 later this month. Yeah, go Delphine. But you wouldn't have known it. She was the sweetest little thing, all smiles, sharp as a tack, with that, that glint in her eye, that glint like someone who understands what really matters in life. You know, you all know that look. We've seen it in so many of our elders. It's like they're holding a secret. In her hair, Delphine wore a red handkerchief with white polka dots, just like Rosie the Riveter. <laughs> you see, in the 1940s, Delphine was a clerk in an American bomber factory during the war. She worked running small parts and blueprints from worker to worker. Delphine helped win a war before she was 20 years old. I mean, just think of everything she's lived through. Five kids, 39 grandkids, great-grandkids, great-great-grandkids. Delphine has seen a stock market crash, a Great Depression, a world war, a cold war, a daughter she lost at the age of 30. Delphine has seen Babe Ruth and Serena Williams. <laughs> She's seen Selma and the internet. She's seen Sandy Hook. She's seen Roe v. Wade and its rollback. She's seen Jim Crow, I Have a Dream, and Yes We Can. <laughs> And after all of that, when she thinks about this country, she sees the same thing I do, the same thing you do. And these are her words, Delphine, I hope you're listening. She says, this is a wonderful, compassionate country. Huh? See, that's her secret. After all she's lived through, more than anything else, she still sees compassion. She still sees our wonder. And this is what I want you all to remember. We have a lot of work to do in this country. But it is joyful work. It is purposeful work. But it is an undeniable fact that we live in a more perfect union than when we started when most of the folks in this room couldn't vote because they weren't a man or white or a landowner. It is an undeniable fact that my mother, who I lost this year, wasn't welcome at department stores as a young woman. But for eight years, she had the best view in America from her room in the White House. undeniable fact that my mother's journey, that Delphine's journey, that all of our journeys were possible only because of people who fought for it and bled for it and protested for it and, yes, voted for it. That's how it works in this country. We've got to vote. deeply, but we do not cast our ballots, the people who win those elections will not assume that we care. They'll assume that we don't. They will assume that we are happy to hand our power over to them. See, our absence will not make those in charge hear us better. And I've been at seats of power. I know how they think. See, instead, our absence will be taken as our consent. They will take our indifference as part of their mandate to do whatever they want. Folks, the process will go on with or without you. Decisions will be made. Judges will be appointed. Laws passed. So we have three days, y'all, to make a difference in this election and take part in the process. And here in Pennsylvania, a very special state y'all are in, 
You can do that by voting on Election Day, 7 a.m. to 8 p.m., y'all. And if you have a mail-in ballot here in Montgomery County, you can drop it off at a ballot drop box until 8 p.m. on election night. You can find the nearest location at IWillVote.com. If you don't know that, write it down. So make your plan. And after you've made your plan, after you've voted, I want to ask you to ask yourself if you can do something to help other people, to get out the vote for other people, because what you do over these next three days will absolutely make the difference, y'all. Let me give you just a sense. Four years ago, the presidential race in Pennsylvania was decided by about 80,000 votes. Now, that may sound like a lot, but this is a big state. And when you break those numbers down, that's less than nine votes per precinct. Yeah. Just nine votes per precinct determine who won Pennsylvania's electoral vote. The same year in Iowa, there was an entire congressional district decided by six votes. Six votes, y'all. That, that's your group chat. <laughs> that's your fantasy football league, or at least half of it. So just think about it. Maybe you and your friends can swing the whole presidential election. That is possible. That is the power. That is the real power that you have, especially in the state. So here's my advice. If you're feeling anxious, if you're wringing your hands about what's going to happen on Tuesday, I want you to recognize that you have the power to make all the difference for Kamala Harris and Tim Walls. So here's my questions. Are you going to sit around and complain? No. Or are you going to do something for Kamala Harris? Yeah. Look, if your brother or your boyfriend are him in a hawing about voting, are you willing to have an uncomfortable conversation with them to lift up Kamala Harris? Yeah. Can you do that? If you have an extra afternoon tomorrow or can take the day off on Tuesday, are you willing to knock on some doors to lift up Kamala Harris? If you have a car, are you willing to drive folks to the poll to vote for Kamala Harris, y'all? This is what it's going to take, Pennsylvania. All of us doing our part. All of us putting on our polka-dotted headbands and getting our hands dirty. See, that's how we move past the shadows and into the light. That's how we usher in a new generation of leadership. That is how we manifest our love for each other, for our children, and for this country. And yes, that is how we elect the next president and vice president of the United States, Kamala Harris and Tim Walls. God bless you all. Thank you. Let's get to work. Let's get this done. Let's do this thing, Pennsylvania. We're praying and counting on you to get it done. Love you all.